I looked around at my surroundings. I was in a small supply room with another decorative hole on the right wall. There was a ladder near the wall across from me, leading into a square-shaped hole in the floor. Maybe if I go home, I'll get another call from Cynthia? No, I wasn't going to do that again. Just because it happened once wouldn't guarantee that it would happen again. The best thing to do was to continue looking for the exit. If she didn't show up by the time I found it, then I would actively look for her. So I made a mental note of the location of the hole in case I'd need it later and went down the ladder. When I got to the bottom, I found myself standing on a metal lattice that was bolted to the walls and suspended a few feet off the floor. I was glad for this when I noticed that the floor and the walls were smooth and ivory colored, covered with dark brownish red splotches. The effect was unsettlingly like flesh splattered in blood. It was probably a trick of the light, but I had learned that common sense couldn't always be trusted in this place. Down the hallway, I came to a break in the lattice that was covered with old wooden planks that creaked when I walked over them. I tried carefully, then continued down the hallway. After a while, my head began to throb again, so I started running and was able to just barely dodge a ghost that had emerged from a wall and lunged at me. Considering that these things could cause pain and disorientation simply by being near me, I didn't want to find out what would happen if one actually caught me. I continued running down the hallway until I came to a flight of descending stairs. I ran down those as well and through the door at the end. Now I was on another subway platform and a dog was wandering around nearby. I decided to dispatch this one as quickly as possible so I could be on my way. So I reached for my gun and shot it three times. It fell to the floor twitching so I finished it off with a pipe. Just then I saw something at the corner of my eye to the right that gave me a serious scare and I reluctantly turned my head to see what I thought was a giant worm. I gasped in horror and had to instantly cover my mouth and nose with my hand to keep myself from gagging, as the smell coming from it was hideous. It was similar colors as the room I had just been in. It had to have been nearly as thick as my height, and God only knew how long. It was dangling from above the wall, twitching and pulsating. I risked a look over the edge and saw that it wasn't a worm after all, but some sort of thick fleshy tube, more like an organ than an animal. This can't be real, I said as I looked up. I was attempting to see what it was connected to, but all I could see above was blackness. It was simply too dark to see well. Without further hesitation, I took off running along the subway platform. After a while, I came upon a strange metal structure that could only be described as a cage. It contained a mannequin which was cut in half at the waist and pinned down by several spear-like weapons impaling it. It was covered in blood, real or fake, I couldn't tell. Even though it was merely a decoration, I still shook my head in horror at what it symbolized, wondering what kind of sicko would put it there in the first place. I knew that if I stayed there too much longer, I would surely lose my sanity, or perhaps I'd become desensitized and stop caring about what I was seeing. I have to get out of here, I said, not wanting to find out which it would be. And then, as if in response, Henry, I found the exit. Come to the turnstile. It was Cynthia's voice coming from the loudspeaker and sounding, well, I wouldn't use the word happy, but she definitely sounded pleased. I sighed in relief. It was like an answer to a prayer. Not only was Cynthia okay, but she'd found a way out. Way to go, Cynthia. Henry, I found the exit. Come to the turnstile. Too bad that I had no way of letting her know that I was hearing her. I continued along the platform, picking up the pace to a run. Hurry, hurry. It's him. He's coming. I began running faster. I turned a corner to find another escalator, this one ascending. Figuring it must be the turnstile Cynthia was referring to, I quickly stepped on and began running up, attempting to make the trip to the top faster. Unfortunately, if anything, my carelessness caused the trip to take longer. Before I knew what happened, I heard a hideous roar and saw a blurred mass as something appeared in front of me, slamming me in the forehead and sending me in a backward tumble. The movement of the escalator caused me to somersault painfully onto my back. Fortunately, my head landed between two steps instead of on the corner of one, so I avoided a concussion by sheer luck. Difficult as it was, I forced myself to stand and I looked up to realize that the walls of this place also appeared fleshy. But that was now the least of my worries. Vaguely humanoid creatures were coming out of the wall to take a violent swipe with a long slender arm before retreating back into the wall. 
They lined the wall as far as I could see. If I was to make it through this gauntlet alive, I would have to time my movements carefully. As I saw one emerging about ten feet ahead of me, I realized that they didn't have eyes, making my task somewhat easier. It took a blind swipe, and as it went back in, I began charging forward. It attempted to come back out again, but it missed me by a hair. I repeated the process with the next several. When another one came by, I did it yet again, but I didn't expect a second one to show up so close to it. It accomplished what its partner had not, sending me face first into the elevator steps. Again, I was lucky and landed in such a way as to not get my nose broken. I looked up and was thankful to see the top of the ride, and that there didn't appear to be any more monsters. Unfortunately, there was still no relief in sight. No sooner had I reached the top and entered the next room than I heard moaning and felt another headache coming on. Groaning and wincing with pain, I forced my battered self to my feet and ran to the other side of the room, where there was a set of stairs and a sign that read, Exit South Ashfield Station. Thankfully at the top was the turnstile, but I almost instantly forgot it when I noticed some objects on the ground. A woman's purse and several makeup items lay scattered on the floor by a door. They had to have been Cynthia's. I went to the door itself. It displayed a red metal placard on it which was etched a nude woman along with the word temptation. I thought about what it might mean and I had to swallow a lump in my throat. The door was locked. I removed the placard and heard a click signifying that the action, for whatever reason, unlocked the door. But as I opened the door, my heart sank. In an office-type room, Cynthia lay on the floor, barely conscious. She was covered with stab wounds and more blood than I had ever seen. I quickly ran to her side and took her hand. She had a pulse, but it was faint. In my panic, I blurted out, Are you okay? Which was a stupid question, but I wasn't aware of it at the time. I just wanted her to be okay so badly that I needed to know if there was a chance, no matter how slim. I know you're not supposed to move an injured person so as not to make things worse, but there was no saving her now. Even if it had been possible to call an ambulance, it was too late for her. I carefully took her in my arms and held her, comforting her as much as I could. Her eyes fluttered open. It's just a dream, right? Her face was streaked with blood. Her breathing was labored and she had to force the words out. I had to avert my eyes for a moment, almost unable to bear seeing her in such a state. I think I drank too much last night. She reached out and touched my cheek, seeming to appreciate what I was trying to do. I never got to do that special favor for you. Because I never got you out of here, I thought, but didn't say, as I squeezed her hand. I... I feel like I'm dying! Seeing her like this was heartbreaking and difficult to endure, but I wasn't going to leave her now. If I couldn't save her, I would at least try to make her last moments as bearable as possible. It's okay, I said softly. It's just a dream. She began to convulse and I knew the end was near. Mere seconds after it started, her body went limp. Her hand slipped out of mine, and her head fell back as she died. As I gently lowered her to the floor, I couldn't help but notice that numbers had been carved into her left breast, presumably with a knife. 16121. I had no idea what it meant, but seeing this graffiti on her was adding insult to injury, so I positioned her hand over it. The last thing I did for her was place my hand over her eyes and gently close the lids. She was gone. Cynthia? I had woken up in my room yet again, groggy, wondering if perhaps it was nothing more than a horrible dream, or at least hoping it was. Then I heard the sirens. I stumbled to my window to see an ambulance and a police car parked by the subway entrance. It can't be. Once I left my bedroom, I heard filtered voices accompanied by crackling sounds. It was coming from my stereo in the living room, the one that had stopped picking up signals five days ago. Or was it a full six by now? And now would only respond with silence. I ran to it so I could hear better. Hurry up and get that ambulance! Quit yapping and move her already! Damn, she's got numbers carved into her chest. I wonder if... Then it was cut off by static and the radio seemed to turn off automatically. I tried to turn it back on, but there was no signal, so I snapped it back off. I went to rub my tired eyes when I realized that my cheeks were wet. I dried them with the sleeve of my shirt and gave a depressed sigh. 
I don't know why I cared about Cynthia as much as I did. She was really nothing more than a stranger, no matter how intimate she seemed with me. Perhaps it was nothing more than my isolation making me want to reach out to whomever I happened to come across, and she just happened to be in the right place at the right time. Or maybe I felt guilty for not being able to protect her in the end. Whatever the case, she didn't deserve to die the way she did, but I rationalized that she was probably in a better place now, and therefore she was the lucky one. Rest in peace, Cynthia.